Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Lucky Boy Records podcast. Today, we have JJ from Dear Ramona, or full name being... Joshua. That's just, that's that's, just your full that name. Is my, that is my... You I'm don't like have Madonna. any other names. <laughs> <laughs> it is Josh. Do, do I have to give my full name? Do it. Joshua Danks Smith. There you go. That's a good name. Good, thank you. Welcome. I feel very on the spot. Well, yeah, you're, this is, there's so much pressure right now. <laughs> there's a light burning in my eyes at this point. We've actually got... The lighting in this room is very, very cosy right now. It's lovely. We've got I, fairy lights everywhere. Um, we've got like a... Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Like a Super Mario uh, light. It's like a one of those one-up blocks or something. It's got a question mark on it, but it's lighting up the room very well. Yeah. Although I do feel a bit like I'm being seduced. This is very mood lighting. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All right. Well... Let's just start. What do you do in in the in the whole world of music in York? So I suppose in York, um, well, I was um, before you were on the committee for the University Band Society. I was the sound technician, um, so I kind of ran the sound tech for the gigs, made sure people got all the equipment that they needed, um, and did a lot of organisational stuff. And was at gigs whenever I could be. Um, mm-hmm. And then, yeah, now, because I'm not at the uni anymore, which is a whole other thing, um, I just kind of play with you, mostly. Yeah. Open mics and with Dear Ramona, write a few songs, go and support the local music scene. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. You say that's it, but that's probably quite a bit. Yeah. All, all things considering, especially as someone who's graduated. Um, but yeah, I think it's really nice how you're still about in New York. Because I've known you for quite a while now. I think I've probably known you for about, well, probably for like two years. Yeah. Well, one and a half. Yeah, yeah. Um, but ever since um, I started doing music in New York, you've been part of it, I think. Um, well, when I t- started taking it like pretty seriously. Um, especially with the open mics in Vanbrugh, because when they started, that's when things probably kicked off. And we basically did all of them together whenever the open mics Absolutely. were Absolutely, yeah. It was uh, a big change. But it was just kind of, it was something that didn't take too much organisation and people really loved it yeah. and uh, it just kind of all fell into place, didn't it, really, then? Yeah, that it was, it was, that's a really... That's, it's cool because that's something completely outside of band society because that's something which Vanbra College uh, started um, off the bat of one of the refreshers events, I think it was. They had, like, Vanbra Rocks and then they were just like, hey, let's have, a, like, a recurring music event. And, Absolutely. And Open Mic was such a good thing to do and I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to, like, basically perform every single other week <laughs> yeah it's been great yeah but in terms of band society you were i think you were the technician before i even knew you properly then mm-hmm. um, and towards the end of your year in band society things got quite <laughs> i remember things got quite stressful for you yes yeah well it was it was a big organizational task and i mean you were quite lucky you know in that um the society you've got a really good committee i'm not saying ours was bad yeah but we had a very small committee mm-hmm. and um, you know, we were all in our final year and so we were kind of juggling mm-hmm. uni work and all these massive gigs which were not made easier by no. the kind of university, which was a shame. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they gave us a lot of good opportunities, but we, how do I put this delicately, <laughs> had to put in a lot of effort to organise them and they were always kind of, throwing curveballs at us not giving us much support and all that kind of stuff but you know it's you know and the history of bandsock has been ropey the last kind of five years i'd say we've had a a few committees that are really committed and a few that um kind of missed the mark a bit yes i suppose i can't use too bad language can i but um, (laughs) they you know not particularly nice people not supportive people yeah um i think one thing that's really changed about the, the music scene it, it, at the uni and I think perhaps more in the in the city as well is that it's a bit more inclusive and there feels like a lot more people getting involved mm-hmm. whereas it was very it was very cliquey it was kind of the band yeah. sock show before that, wasn't that, it? yeah before I think before my second year when I was in first year I wasn't really sure what band society was meant to be because it would always be like the same bands playing um, and like this group of people who I w- wouldn't feel very comfortable like approaching. Yeah. But that's the one thing which I think over the past couple of years, especially this year, I've really tried to do is like 
make people feel like they can do whatever they want. Um, Cause that's, I think that's, that's the nature of being in a band. You should be able to have the freedom, the creative freedom to be who you want to be with certain people who you choose. Well, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I kind of see, you know, bands and, and group activities as a kind of all inclusive thing. Mm. And you've got to, it's got to be easy to make that first step. Um, cause I know, I think you were kind of talking to Jordan before about finding a band and finding people. It can be very difficult to make that step. And yeah. then if people are kind of shunning you away, then you just, you're not going to get anywhere. And, yeah. you know, an open, the open mics, the, the meet and jams, that kind of open and inviting atmosphere, I think is really important for, mm. for music. And for me, that's kind of really what it's a lot of what it's all about. Yeah, it definitely, I think. Yeah, I think the whole vibe of Bandstock and the York music scene has definitely changed over the past couple of years. I've definitely seen it changed. I think it's been a really nice one, though. I think it's just getting people to know where to look for something. Because people have different kind of wants when they enter like a uni and want to like explore the music scene. Like, some people want to participate. Some people want to help like organize stuff or do like tech. I think it was very unclear like when I joined where you were meant to fit in and where you were meant to go to get that kind of experience. Um, but I think a lot of it is like offered quite like now quite quite nicely. I think. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Agree with all that, yeah. Especially with the bigger society, which I'm very happy with. But yeah, it's definitely definitely got more members, more traction. I mean, the um, the Battle of the Bands last year, we went from. So I, <laughs> I was in uh, so the the committee before I joined. I was in a very interesting band called uh, Cream Dreams. Mm-hmm who classified themselves as Astro Indie Rock, <laughs> um, which was something else. And I thought we, well, I don't, want to be, I don't want to be too harsh. I really enjoyed playing with them, but our music was at times very, very, very bad. Oh, my God. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was definitely niche taste. And we, we went into the Battle of the Bands with about five other bands or four other bands, one of whom was Kraken. Right, yeah. And uh, Below Bermuda and whatever the committee bands were at the time. Yeah. And, you know, all great bands, but you were all kind of rock and heavy, and we got pretty much straight through to the final of the Battle of the Bands against these four other bands. Yeah. And, you know, we really chuffed. But actually, I think that was kind of a statement of, I think people were just happy to see something different Mm -hmm. and to see some new bands come in yeah and then the year that i was on committee the year after we had 20 odd bands at the battle of the bands we had like two yeah two initial heats and then the final and all that kind of stuff and we were juggling acts and you know it was a shame that had to let a few people down and you know Mm. all that kind of stuff but it was still very inclusive and those first heats were jam-packed i mean they were amazing the first one yeah, they made a stupid amount of money on the bar. Oh, I have, I have no clue. <laughs> it was it was over like a good kind of couple of grand or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it was mad money, and it was just a fantastic night. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think kind of popularity and the amount of bands emerging has has really really kind of changed and improved over the last few years. Yeah, I think it's really cool, like seeing you go from like the whole Korean Dreams thing. So when I, cause even when I remember Korean Dreams and when I was seeing them play, I would never think that you were part of that band. No. <laughs> it's really strange to me, like thinking about how you were part of that. Cause I don't know you for that. I know you for like other things and I just don't have that. I still don't really have that association in my head. Cause there was such a different band to like the things which you play now. It was, it was funny. I, could, I mean, I still meet people now who knew Sam and George um, from Cream Dreams and, yeah. you know, they kind of knew us and they came to this play and the, and I'll go, Oh, I was in, it'll come up in conversation. I'll go, Oh, I was in Cream Dreams. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, you weren't. I was like, yes, yes, I was actually. Oh. Um, but no, I mean, and it was it was really good fun. And having the support of like Jerry and stuff, you know, at, at Summer Ball, they all came up on stage and sang with us. And it was it was really nice to be kind of loved and accepted. Yeah. I think purely because we had that unique factor about us. Yeah. Um, and we had a couple of good songs. I keep remembering it. The one thing I remember is that one of the singers in the band sounds like the guy from the Pet Shop Boys. And I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, we we had some, yeah, interesting mix of sounds and talents in the band. I think it was it was it was cool though. I did enjoy watching you. Yeah, um, 
I remember having a conversation with one of the guys playing, being like, "Oh wow, you sound like Mac DeMarco." <laughs> but I, it's because it's because I was I wasn't too sober when I was talking to him, so I felt, I felt really bad because I was just like, "Did I really just say that to him?" He probably yeah. gets that all the time. Yeah. Um, well, it was a thing. It's it's a thing that I don't think about that often. But <laughs> yeah. But now you're in you're in Diramani. Diramani, yes. As you have been for the past what year year, year and basically. a half. Yeah. 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 It was. Yeah. A while, but yeah, no, and that's been really good. That's been, that's been a really nice experience actually, because I was very much, not hired help, but Mm -hmm. it was very much, Green Dreams was very much, the the guitarists' band. They'd made the songs and they'd done some really horrific recordings of them, (laughs) and uh, they wanted to play live, so they got me in on bass and um, my other friend Sam in on drums. So we were just kind of the rhythm section and it was their band. Yeah. Whereas Dear Ramona, it's been, it's been great because we've all, um, so I mean, John has kind of, uh, moved out of York now, so he's not in the band anymore. Um, but, um, you know, kind of having a lot more creative input and actually all of us working together, you know, we've written songs, you know, Kate and I bring in some of our songs, but we'll also sit and kind of just jam and come up with stuff and it's been great and i mean we've written not that we play them all but we've written loads of different stuff i mean yeah. john and i did like um some kraut rock riffs and kind of all that kind of stuff and then you've got my kind of plunky folky rock stuff and then you've got like, kate's yeah she's like pop punky kind of wolf alice kind of absolutely stuff. so it's been really nice and actually it's been nice as well kind of now honing in on what we want to sound like and I think you're and you have helped with that and you will help with that because you're now on guitar yeah which I'm so I am not a lead guitarist in any way (laughs) shape or form so I'm so happy to hand that over um but yeah kind of and now honing in on that because we've still got those songs and we can tweak them and adjust them Mm -hmm. but we can really find our sound and I think people kind of are appreciating that and looking forward yeah. to that and to hearing more well, stuff I think from whenever us. people have heard heard De Ramona, like it's in, like you can definitely hear all the different influences in there. Um it's it, it's interesting hearing differences between like Amber, um, which is the the theme song for the podcast. Oh it is. <laughs> and uh like Empathy, which should be out soon, Broken Record. They're all completely different songs. Yeah. But I think it's quite nice kind of having that kind of genre sh- like differences. Um Especially with like having like Kate as a lead singer on some of the songs as well. Do you find it hard to like balance like having two lead vocalists or? Uh, I must admit, yes. Uh, but I, I see. I don't mind it. I really like having two different vocalists. I, yeah. I quite like having lots of sounds because one thing I always note is that kind of we will write a song or we'll play a song and we'll go, oh, that was that's kind of our song that we really like, and then I'll come out of a gig. And someone will say, oh, actually, I really liked it better, for example. They were like, I yeah. absolutely loved that. And to me, that's just something that it was kind of one of our kind of, I wouldn't, I don't want to say mediocre, but one of our less preferred songs. And yeah. then loads of people come up to me and then go, oh, that's amazing. And then a load of other people go, oh, no, actually, not where I want to be. That's our favorite one and all this yeah. kind of stuff. Um, but I think, you know, kind of going back to kind of balancing Kate and I, I quite like that, you know, I'll do some songs, Kate will do some songs, and then when we come together, I really, I love that. That's that's think, some of the coolest things I think you guys do. Like yeah. That's why I think Not Where I Want to Be is one of the coolest songs you yeah. do. Because it's quite, well, it, you've definitely focused on having that difference between the two kind of voices, I think. Absolutely. And it's, it's a very, it's a really interesting song, because how we kind of put it together, basically, the verse is Kate's, yeah. and the chorus is mine, Yeah, and... It's all set to the same chords, yeah. <laughs> those bits. That's, and then, fine. that's fine. Sometimes all you need is one chord sequence. Well, it, I know, and I, I quite like that it's quite simple, but yeah. yet there's, you know, there's a different melody in the chorus and then there's the different kind of guitar line. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we all kind of chipped in and wrote the bridge, which I adore. Yeah. I absolutely love the bridge. Um, it's a very, like, uh, psychedelic kind of breakdown. Yeah, it's and cool. the bridge is, I think, very wolf as well. Yeah, kind definitely. Of, you know, Kate and I have got interweaving melodies and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, that's, I think, kind of having that separation of the two vocals and the two styles and then bringing that all together. I think, I think people really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's been really good kind of creative process. It's been really good. Yeah. So, how did it actually start then? Actually, because I don't know if it did if it, if it started with you and Kate or started 
with you, John and James? How did you guys actually meet to get this band together in the first place? So I, it actually started with um, John and myself um, at the kind of Bansock bar crawl, which I was exceedingly drunk at, and so was John, because John was a, a master student. He'd come to York. Yeah. Um, and we, I remember distinctly us bonding over our love of rock um, in the Artful Dodger mm-hmm. with a pint um, playing uh, an ACDC pinball machine. <laughs> um, and we just kind of, you know, got talking and, you know, reminiscing and all that kind of stuff. And then he posted in the Facebook group, which is great. I love people just going, oh, does anyone want to play? And yeah. Like, every, you know, you'll have a few responses. And then he was looking for a band because he is kind of a guitarist, but he really wanted to... Um, experiment with experiment stuff. Yeah, with yeah. bass and all that kind of stuff and i said amazing like if you need a vocalist i'll come in i was going to do rhythm guitar um and then we found kate mm. um who i was also in a band with uh at the time we were doing a folk cover band yeah um with uh polly and polly was lovely but it was kind of a it unfortunately didn't take off which is a shame yeah. um but we had lots of you know we did a rehearsal a week and um polly would do uh, percussion and I'd come in with my guitar and we'd do all these kind of three part harmony songs and it was it was really good fun um, and I say Kate kind of popped up into the scene and I was like oh amazing yes that would be great mm-hmm. um, so she took rhythm of the guitar and then we kind of realised well let's get this started but we didn't have a, a drummer yeah um, and I have no idea where John found James I'm so glad he did yeah but he just kind of popped out of the woodworks and his name was Vladmik something on on Facebook. Oh my god, his Facebook so, is amazing. He is he is just the biggest troll ever, but he's amazing. Oh wow. Um, and so yeah, so he had this kind of weird profile, and Kate and I were a bit like, has has John added some weird kind of Russian man to our chat? What's going on? And then we kind of had. I don't think we'd met James at this point. We'd we'd done a practice the three of us, and kind of sussed out what we wanted to do, mm-hmm. and then. After Christmas, this James just appeared in our chat and Vladimir had disappeared. And we were like, oh, okay. His actual name is James. His actual name is James. So then he turned up and we just kind of went from there. I think the first few rehearsals we're doing, I don't think we ever really did many covers. We just went pretty much straight into... Oh, really? I feel like most bands normally start with covers, kind of get into it. I remember when when I joined Kraken, they already had songs. Hmm. Um, But we, I think we... Because we we did a a gig for MUN uh, in like February, which was about three months after I joined when I was in first year. And we did like Smell Like Team Spirit, like uh, Paranoid and stuff like that. Amazing. Because I always know that you guys do covers. Well, you've done Bro for Wolf Alice quite a bit. Yes. Um, I don't think I've actually heard you do many other covers. Uh, uh, well, we did um, Steady She Goes. Oh, yeah, that's the one you should do. By The Racking Tours, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think we did that. That was one of our first ones that we learned. Uh, Bros was, I think, a bit later, actually. Um, but, yeah, we kind of... I think we started learning a couple of covers and not really getting anywhere with it. But we would... I mean, literally, we just kind of... We had a couple of rehearsals where, before we kind of properly got to know each other, we just kind of sit... And John would start playing something and Kate would kind of hum along. James yeah. would set a beat. And we could literally just kind of sit in, well, not silence, but not talking to each other, just playing stuff. Yeah. And that's kind of where bits of not where I want to be came from. Mm-hmm. And as I say, John and I would kind of write um, riffs. And we did have um, a very kind of, it was a bit Black Hole Sun soundy, a bit grungy, but yeah. quite chill song that we did at, a fourth arms gig but it meh, never took off it never really took off um but yeah so it, pretty much from the off we were we were kind of writing stuff which was amazing i i, I loved it i was yeah. kind of so happy to be not in another cover band <laughs> <laughs> you know i've been in so many cover bands in my time and you know covers are great and i i love it um especially when you're playing with fantastic musicians i mean the the kind of committee cover band that I was in with you and yeah. the Kraken lads. That was that was so much fun because it was so tight. Uh, I wish we'd played more. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, Well, I think it's good that that one started because that's kind of where the open mic stuff came along. Yes. Because we, we changed a lot of those songs so they would work acoustically. 
And that was quite amusing, hearing Crazy Train <laughs> on two acoustic guitars. Everyone loves it. Every time we do it, people oh, it's, it's just so, adore it's it. It's so much fun. And like doing, I think we do No One Knows or Queens of Sony mm-hmm. as well. That's another good one. I think we did, we did both of those in that Bounce Lock Covers band. We did, yeah. And Spoon Man, which you cannot do acoustically. It's, it's too hard of a song. Um, yeah, so it's been yeah a really, a really fun creative process and a really good outlet all that kind of stuff and you know i've dug up songs that i've had in the woodworks for kind of years i mean amber Mm -hmm. being one of them i wrote that when i was 16 which you you still play it it's great i still play it it's good though i'm really glad that we finally got that one not only recorded but you play it all the time and people really know derimona for that song absolutely um which i'm really chuffed about yeah it's like it's a it's a banger because I remember, because well, <laughs> it's a chill. It's, it's a very. <laughs> the thing is, I, sometimes I would I would classify Dear Ramona music as like dad rock, but not in a bad way. <laughs> I think that's that's kind of like the best kind of way I can put it. Because I absolutely love it. It's mm. really nice music, just kind of chill to. It's kind of shoegazy. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. It, it, I think it, it did it go on BBC introducing uh, Amber did yeah it, yeah it got played it mm-hmm. did get played yeah yeah that yeah I'm not surprised because it's well a, thank it's, you it's a good one. Um, but yeah, you still play that to this day. Um, we do, yeah. Are there any other older songs you have? Um, no, well, Better actually was probably from before Amber. I'm yeah. at, so <laughs> I, I've had a, a mixed and interesting career in music, I'd say. Um, yeah. I think Better came from my GCSE music days and I had a very relaxed year where... I mean, I know everyone's going to hate me for saying this, but I'd take my ukulele into school. Oh my and god! <laughs> we'd all be we'd all be kind of sat around, you know, playing whatever you play in a GCSE music class, whether that's the triangle or whatever. And you know, I'd kind of sit there plunk, plunking away at it, and better kind of came out of of that because um, it's a very kind of plunky, you know, something mm-hmm. you can kind of stomp your feet to and. You know that was that was really. I mean, it's a very simple song, but that was quite quite a nice time. I I wrote a lot of songs, then all very obscure. Better was probably kind of my more normal one of those. Um, yeah, I love how you call it plunky, describing it as a plunky. It is. Song. It is a plunky song. <laughs> how would you define plunky? <laughs> I don't, well, I suppose. <laughs> You can't, you can't define it. It's just its own thing. I think, well, exactly. But that's that's what I think when I hear something like that. It's like yeah. punk, but funk. <laughs> that's not at all what it is. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you if you ever get the chance to listen to Better, let me know whether you think it's plunky or not. <laughs> well, one of the most recent songs that you've made is actually one which was written probably a, was it finished like like well it was finished during the recording of it but your christmas song oh yes uh, just another xmas just another xmas as it's um, been shortened to yeah it that was an interesting time recording that one it was it was really good and that that was one i just kind of threw together as it were um i'd i'd had the idea of writing something like it for a while um cuz it's it's based the first verse is kind of based on my sister and I at Christmas and some of the the things that happened and how kind of weird and wonderful Christmas is. And then um, my, my girlfriend, Phoebe, uh, started talking about her sister and her family at Christmas. Yeah. So we were kind of sat writing these these verse lyrics and I kind of went, oh, this is, it, it needs to be really fun and really <laughs> silly and really crazy. And not, I, I absolutely adore all of the artists' Christmas songs yeah. on the uh, Lucky Boy Records Christmas album, but they're all quite mellow. Yeah. I don't want to use the word depressing, but, but I'm edging towards but it. But some of them are, but that's fine. <laughs> Win- oh, it absolutely is. I mean, Winter Blues, You and Rachel Gow, is it's just a gorgeous song, but I kind of really wanted to make something that was going to be, again, plunky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I actually finished off writing it um, on a... On a an oil maintenance vessel in the North Sea, right? Because uh, I was I was out there for two weeks, and they had a guitar in the uh, in the in the workers' lounge. So I'd kind of sit finalising the chords and figuring out the bits and bobs. Figured out the bridge, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, so I wanted something that you could sing it along to. So the bridge at the end is ridiculously simple, but really really good fun. And mm-hmm. yeah, we finished the lyrics and kind of putting it all together in in the studio, which was 
just so much fun. It was a it was a really good laugh. Yeah, that, I think we probably spent about four. Was it actually? It might have been like six hours. I think it was six hours. Yeah, uh, doing you and Kate's Christmas songs. Yeah. Um, I, I remember because it was a work night and I was knackered. Yeah, it went on for so long, <laughs> especially that final guitar bit, which I was trying yeah. to finish. I could literally look in the corner of my eye. I saw you just like dozing off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, we're actually going to listen to that Christmas song right now um, and. Let us know what you think about it. Or maybe don't let us know. I don't know how you're going to let us yeah, know. Yeah, if, if you don't like it, keep it. Keep yeah, it just don't say anything. Um, <laughs> but yeah, have a listen to this. This is Just Another Xmas by Dear Ramona. When Santa drives right past your door For Fiesta towing him along No reindeer to pull his sleigh Oh, what a sad parade Then you wake the kids up from their dreams Tell them that you have to see This strange old man in front of them Can you really blame them if they're scared? It's Christmas time again Children in the Christmas show Little Joseph stood picking his nose Baby Jesus got dropped on his head They broke the flimsy cardboard shed Little Florence suddenly misheard When the teacher named her first shepherd She prances all around the stage Dressed as a leopard It's Christmas time again So that was just another Christmas. It um, was. I mean, for us, it, it's been like five seconds. Um, yeah, that was a really quick song. It was a really quick song. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but it was a. Uh, it's it's an interesting one. I do enjoy it. Um, I think when I listen to it, the only thing I can think of is, is the actual sessions and mm-hmm. how ridiculously uh, they went and how fast they went by. Um, there was lots of stomping, clapping, weird yeah. harmonies, um, lots of yelps, which lots. I think slipped in. They did, yeah. Um, demonic laughing from myself, oh. which you very kindly put in the mix as well. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was and it was nice, kind of taking it home to my family. Uh, I mean, bless her, my sister was like, "Oh, you can't, you can't talk about that." <laughs> it was <laughs> at times she got really, really upset when because oh. um, I woke her up from a sleep, which, as everyone knows, is a very upsetting thing to do. Mm-hmm. But because there was like a. a uh, one of those charity Santas being dragged around, and I went, "Oh, she's got to see." It. Um, for some context, my sister is thirteen years younger than I am. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember it because it was pretty much one of the first times my parents left me to to babysit her by myself, and I got her up, and she was just so tired and so upset. <laughs> and um, but no, it's it's really nice, kind of reminiscing with that um, about that with my family, and they they really enjoyed the song, and I say it was one to kind of put on 
while we're having lunch, having some drinks, have a bit of a, a silly kind of sing song and yeah. and a reminisce. And that's you know, again, it's it's kind of nice. I like I like writing songs that that mean something to me and yeah. that kind of tell a story and that kind of yeah, you can it's, kind of get swept up. You can up definitely in. tell there's a story there. And I think that's really cool. Um especially comparing it to the other Christmas songs like we said earlier. Because although the other Christmas songs are actually probably meant to be quite sad, yes. it was quite nice to have that relief and that bit of silliness in there. Um, I think I, I was sharing it to one of my friends and they were just like, this is the most ridiculous song I've ever heard in my yeah. entire life. And I was just like, perfect. That is absolutely that's, the point. That's exactly <laughs> what this is meant to be. Because um, there's, so, there's been so many cheesy Christmas songs over the past uh, years of like Christmas number ones and everything mm. like that. And this... I wish this got Christmas number one because it deserves it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, that was what I was thinking while I was writing it. I was like, I haven't listened to a new Christmas song <laughs> in probably about 10 years. Yeah. I was like, I just want something shaking Stevensy. I want something crazy that, you know, you just kind of... Yeah, that's what it is. well, you got it. I'm really, I'm really glad that we were able to um, work on... So, well, I'm glad I was able to work on so many Christmas songs over the December period because putting that Christmas charity album together was a lot of fun. How many? Because I know you've been in a lot of bands um, over the past what, like four years. Well, not so much. Well, I had a bit of a, a gap, kind of the first couple of years of uni, and then yeah, I've been in a few. I was in quite a few before uni. I must admit as well. Yeah, because you you say like you've been in bands during uni, but not many people like talk about their music before them because a lot of people, a lot of people don't really take it very seriously. Mm. Um, but uh, in Hinchless podcast, we're talking about him and uh, how he was in a band with his like cousins. Were you in like any bands before uni or uh, not really? Yes, yeah. Um, I did loads of music before uni. Oh, right. Probably probably more than I do now. Um, so I, as I mentioned briefly earlier, I have a, a very varied career in music. Um, I, w- as a singer, I was trained classically. So I was a choral singer. Uh, I was actually a, a countertenor for until I was about 16 or 17. Oh my God. Um, which, for those of you who know what that is, um, yeah, I was quite proud of it. It's, uh, again, quite niche. Um, mm-hmm. So it was, yeah, it was kind of around that time that I then went away from that into rock. Um, but I'm also, if you do listen to Amber, you'll notice, um, I hope, a lovely saxophone solo in the middle, which is, is my doing. And yeah. um, I was a saxophonist and I did a lot of jazz in high school. So um, that's kind of where I started. I think the, you know, the chorus singing was, was great, but I don't really take many kind of inspirations from that. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd really kind of, I think I've carried my jazz with me. Um, I was in a big uh, school's big band, um, which was actually, we did very well for ourselves. We went in competitions, national competitions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I did some singing for that. I did a, a James Brown medley, which I had to have about four pints before I could even attempt. <laughs> nice. Uh, and at the age of 16, that's not, that's not a good thing. No. Nope. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> but um, no, and that was that was really great. And, you know, so I think that's kind of fed through a bit to, to Amber. And, and empathy, I think, touches on a bit jazz. It's kind of, it's more... Well, this is bluesy rock jazz, yeah. I'd say, empathy. Um, or it certainly turned into that when I took it to the band, which mm-hmm. was great. Uh, and then, yes, yeah, so I was in... <laughs> my first band was actually a metal cover band. Really? Yeah, it was. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> with a, a fantastic guitarist, actually. Uh, my friend Alex Beckett and uh, my other friend Callum. And um, we... I mean, it, it wasn't anything kind of spectacular. We do gigs at the local pubs mm. and we usually get paid in alcohol and it was it was your proper kind of teenager let's go and do some gigs and yeah. it was great and it was fun and our curveball was that our encore song was a kind of heavy version of um thunderbirds are go by busted what? <laughs> so we d- we, no way. we we did a um a, a kind of party at a, a pub for all the staff that were there and I just remember the faces of everyone going, what's this when we started playing our final song? Um, but yeah, so that was great. And then I was in a band called um, The Equinox, uh, which we were mainly a covers band. We did a few of our own songs, but we never really gigged them, unfortunately, because mm-hmm. it was kind of that time, A-levels, and everyone was thinking about going off. And, you know, I absolutely loved those guys. We, um, Our big thing, actually, was um, mashups. Right. 
we so we did um yeah i i adore kind of putting together different styles of music kind of as we've spoken about before yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know all these different songs and piecing them together we had uh, one which was actually written as a as a um memorial for um one of our teachers who mm. uh, passed away bless him um and we played it at his at his memorial service although a very yeah. shortened version of it yeah, yeah. um it was called the satisfaction of playing blackjack with the devil mm. because it was comprised of rolling stones songs yeah satisfaction paint it black Sympathy, Sympathy for the devil yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and another one maybe um yeah and you know that was great for me. it was like an eight minute epic mm-hmm. we played it at a at a um kind of county music competition mm-hmm. and everyone loved it but we got instantly disqualified because it, well it specified to be honest we didn't technically break any rules um but we had a 10 minute set or two songs yeah so we played uh gold on the ceiling by Black Keys. Yeah. And then we did our seven minute epic. So it went like, epic. About like two minutes over then. Well, it was fine. No, because it, it was about three minutes and seven minutes. Oh, so okay. I think we were dead on the time. We didn't exceed the time. But all the judges were like, but that was five songs in one song. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. So everyone was kind of going, is that is that okay? And I was like, oh, that's fine. And I mean, there was there were some really good bands. So it wasn't like we were kind of in contention for winning, but yeah. I, w- I was happy to be a talking point and everyone really enjoyed it <laughs> and we loved it. So it was, yeah. it was kind of win-win, but kind of in on the flip side, it was quite funny because oh there was a, there was a, a like a little jazz band and yeah. you know, all, all your kind of jazz numbers, um, kind of ride, Sally, ride, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> They're like two minute songs. Yeah. So they had a four minute set for two songs oh, yeah, and yeah. we had like 10 minutes of, and it, you know it was kind of it, it was definitely a grey area but mm. it was a lot of fun I, can't, and, I didn't realise you had been in so many bands before uni yeah that's crazy because I was only really in one before I got to uni and that was like a metal band we did like mostly originals with some covers as well um I think most people normally start with heavier music when yeah. they start playing in bands I think in, it, well what, what I've heard of people anyway yeah and I mean for me it was just well, I you know I must admit that I was in a bit of a heavier phase at the time. I was very into Soundgarden, Queen yeah. Stone Age, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, and um, it, it was just kind of the people that I was surrounded with, and that was what they wanted to play. And I went, well, I'll okay play with you, yeah. and you know, and then yeah, so the Equinox, we did more Green Day, Red Hot Chili's, mm-hmm. Killers, uh, Kaiser Chiefs, that kind of stuff, and you know we did a few few festival gigs, not big festivals, obviously, but little local festivals, yeah. and we did the circuit, and we had a name for ourselves, and yeah, it was, it was really good. Yeah, that's all you can really hope for when you're in a small band. I think it's quite hard to kind of, like, break the scene and just become, like, regulars and, like, known for what you're doing, um, especially in somewhere like, well, I was from in Bedford, where it was basically entirely metal, um, but where you, where you were doing music when you were starting off, was it quite easy to kind of, like, put yourself out there, or was it a bit hard to kind of know where to start it was it was quite strange actually because um so i'm from stratford upon avon Mm -hmm. which the 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 music scene at the time was really changing and i know it's kind of (laughs) it's quite a big thing to talk about in quite a small town yeah but stratford was actually quite well known for its music there's been quite a few bands come out of stratford and famous people kind of in around that area yeah um and um one of the main music venues, which was Cox's Yard, we that was where we played a couple of times. But just as we played there, it kind of shut down mm. and the music stopped. And that kind of had a knock-on effect for the entirety of, of the town. And then there was it basically stopped. Most local venues stopped doing gigs. Mm. So if you wanted a gig... You'd kind of have to put it on yourself. Yeah. So it, you know, you'd book out the venue, you'd sort everything out, which you know is obviously fine, but it it wasn't. It was people doing music for kind of selfish reasons rather than it being the music yeah. scene in Stratford. It's gotten a lot better now. Um, you know, there's there's the acoustique. Uh, I think that's how I'm saying it. Um, is you know they showcase local artists, and we were involved in um, an arts and performance charity so we had links we recorded with them we put on gigs with them um we played at the stratford river festival which was amazing Mm. um and you know so it's kind of built back up again over the years and i think is continuing there's a lot more pubs doing gigs and you know a lot more music 
in in Stratford, which is great, and I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was. It's. I mean, you know, we talk about it in York and talk about it in Stratford and everywhere. The the music scene, kind of everywhere at the moment, is a very changeable thing. Yeah. And you know, I think things like independent venue week and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff is great for keeping the momentum going. But it's it's a very interesting time for music at the moment. Yeah, it's it's it definitely differs as well between different cities. Like York has always kind of had the exact same music scene; it hasn't really changed. Yeah. Um, same as Bedford, where there's just metal all the time. There's a, there's a few indie acts that come out of there now and then. Um, but yeah, it it does just depend. I think most people just normally gravitate towards like Leeds or like Manchester. Yeah. Or Liverpool as well, because there's always music going on there. But with smaller towns like Stratford upon Avon, um, and even like Stony Stratford and Milton Keynes, where I play some music when I come back from York, um, it's it's always you've got to kind of stay on your feet and kind of keep active if you want to stay in the know about what's going on. Yeah. Um, you've you've always obviously we just talk about being in all those bands, but um, recently, well, you've you graduated oh, and, yeah. and now you've got a full-time job. Yes. Is it hard now balancing work and a full-time job? Well, first of all, what is your, what is your job? What do you do in York now? <laughs> it's, it takes a long time to explain. Well, um, we've I, got time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in short, well, I'm a, I'm a embedded software engineer. Uh, yeah. So I did electronics um, at university and I do techie things. Um, yeah basically and mm. i mean that's a that's a nine to five kind of thing um i'll get friday afternoons off um which is always nice i've not been working there long no and when i started it was the summer holiday yeah for uni so actually we've kind of not had that many gigs or rehearsal spaces uh well rehearsal times um and so it's not been too bad and when you know we we book our rehearsal slots in the evening which is which is good uh, and now that I've got a car, yes, yeah, then it's going to be. It's. I think it is going to be easier. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, if we get big and I have to travel, which is possibly unlikely, um, then it's going to be something to work around. Um, I know we have talks of gigs possibly in in Leeds yeah. um, later this year and stuff like that, which would be amazing, and I would make it work. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I think I think that's the bottom line, especially for me is. I will make it work, you know, because that's what yeah, I want to do. Exactly. And, you know, I couldn't imagine, especially at the moment, I think, you know, in a couple of years, everyone's going to be going their separate ways and it's going to be less likely to happen. But music is such a big part of my life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, work can't be my whole life. And I'm really happy that that other part of my life is music. Yeah. And that's something I can do and it takes up my spare time. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of effort for someone who moves straight from graduating into a full time job to be able to keep alive their hobbies, especially music, because mm. it does require a lot of time sometimes. Um, I feel like people, when they graduate and they go straight into a job, they want to make the job work. And it's good that you've got that kind of, um, well, stability to kind of just do other stuff around it and you have the time as well um, outside of nine to fives. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I I do count myself very, very lucky. Yeah. Um, you know, because, I mean, for me, you know, I, I say to people, oh, I did electronic engineering at uni, and for the people that knew me in high school, they kind of go, oh, wow, I thought you'd have done drama or music or something. Yeah. And actually, yes, I would have loved that, but I'm really happy with music being my hobby and, you know, I can afford to have it as a hobby mm-hmm. because I've kind of got my job and I've got that time. You know, nine to five, coming out of uni, you go, oh, nine to five is, oh, that's going to kind of take up a lot of time, which is bizarre considering I was doing like 10 a.m. till 2 a.m. sessions in the lab on my yeah. phone. Um, but actually, it's it's really not that bad. I kind of get home in the evening and go, oh, I've got... Well, I've time. got quite a lot of time to kill. Yeah. And, you know, and it's 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 definitely different because i mean uni you go you do your work you do your music possibly do a bit more work probably do a bit more music drink maybe sleep for a couple of hours <laughs> and you know and then and then repeat and it's so full on mm-hmm. but actually yeah it does it's a different experience yeah i think i, I think now. i think as with like uni and like full-time jobs and just like i guess just life in general it's all about getting like a routine absolutely and i think you can get that quite easily if you have a nine to five every week um yeah. and just planning your whole life around it um 
which I think is it's not a bad way to to go. I think. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think with someone with a tech background as yours as well, it's quite nice to be able to like still be able to pursue that outside mm. of like your job because you can if you if you wanted to, I'm sure you could like do some like uh, like studio work or like yeah. editing like even like with me as well if you wanted to. So it's quite nice to be able to have that link with uni still and be yeah. able to like pursue things which you like outside of just playing music absolutely yeah i must admit i do miss mixing live mixing that's one thing i haven't done since i've i've started my job yeah and i mean it was stressful especially when i was pretty much the only person doing it yeah but it's so rewarding as well and uh, you know kind of having the bands you know i was called upon in mostly emergencies when Mm -hmm. tech people didn't show up so i'd have to run across run across campus, run across town to gigs yeah. and venues and stuff. But actually kind of making it all work and making it come together was, was so satisfying. Yeah. And the occasional being paid for it was always lovely. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, yeah, something I'd like to get back into. But it's just, as I say, it's getting the time, the opportunities, yeah. kind of... Luckily, most of the pieces are kind of fitting together for me at the moment. Mm-hmm. And I so say I'll just try and make it work. Yeah, I think with live mixing, it's quite nice to ha- kind of have that control. You're yeah. kind of at the throne of the music going on. <laughs> that's Absolutely. The one, that's the one thing which I really like about being behind a desk, even like in a studio or a live scenario, you can just like do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, if you don't like the vocalist, turn them off. <laughs> just that's turn it. off completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, we before we started this, we actually recorded a live session we did. of you playing a song because I wanted to try that out and it came out really well. <laughs> um, this isn't, well, this isn't a Dear Ramona track. This is a song you wrote. Right? Okay, so this is actually a song I wrote a few years ago as well. Um, not as long ago. I was, I think it was the summer before I started uni. Mm-hmm. So this was, you know, I'm very much someone who writes a song in a moment. You know, it, yeah. I was kind of reminiscing on uh, my friends um, that I've had throughout uh, my high school career and kind of the friends that I was meeting and getting to know at university yeah. and kind of reflected on that because it was a great summer. It was a fantastic summer. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Looked really nice weather. I went on holiday with my family, went on holiday with my friends, did a load of gigs, kind of did everything I wanted to do before I got to uni. And this is kind of a reflection and some comments that, you know, the lyrics are all about what happened over that summer and all that kind of stuff. And it's quite, quite, it's quite chill. Um, definitely not a plunky one, this one. Um, but yeah, it was kind of quite reminiscent and tells the story of yeah. all that kind of time in my life, really. All right. Well, this is a song called White Out. The heat is ghastly. The sand between my toes. Then there's the sea spray. And sunburn on my nose. It's a long journey Full of obstacles You drove badly But we reached our goal Not many folks have friends like you Shove it up his ass I played some music You took me back to yours Oh, I'm not saying What went on behind closed doors Not many folks are friends like you I'm 
I'm just so glad that I do That was white out. It was. Um, well, how do you find it? Because I guess you write this all on your on your own, as opposed to writing it like with uh, Kate or like other people in Diramona. So, yeah, I mean, I I would never ever 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 consider myself as a solo artist. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I think partly that comes from my jazz background. You know, playing in a big band, even as a vocalist, you're still a cog in the machine. Yeah, you know you. If you if you're singing New York New York at a party, you're going dun 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 dun. dun you know, it's all the <laughs> instruments and it's this whole thing. So when I write music, for the most part, I write. You know, I'll have a melody and probably some chords, but I will try and write and get down an idea or some ideas or some things, and then I'll take it to my bandmates. I mean, for that one, it was one that I wrote kind of for myself um which is quite unusual um and i think you can kind of tell because it's very chill very simple um <laughs> although saying that i got you to do some of the harmonies with me <laughs> um uh, but yeah so i kind of wrote that for myself um whereas yeah i much prefer taking things to people you know i'll bring ideas to you or i'll take things to kate um and john and actually seeing other people shape the song I find really satisfying and I find a lot easier because I'm no, I'm no expert. I mean, I'm, you know, my, my strongest instrument is probably the bass guitar after, yeah. after the saxophone. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy writing a bass line, love writing bass lines. Mm-hmm. I want to do it more if anything. Yeah. Um, so I'll write that, but then everything else, I want other people's expertise and actually seeing people shape it into something completely different. Well, maybe not completely different, yeah. but something different, something that's ours it's really satisfying. Yeah, I think it's really rewarding when you get to hear your song, which you wrote, in different contexts, mm. um, especially in that kind of situation where you give it to like a group of people to play and it just comes out completely different to how you thought it would. It's it's absolutely amazing. So I, um, I must admit, I had one song um, that I wrote, which was quite an angsty song. It was called Screw You and it was mm-hmm. this whole thing. Again, one I wrote kind of maybe slightly later in my teenage years. But I've done that with kind of three different bands now and it's been amazing seeing how different it is yeah so one was quite jazzy it was very swung um it was a bit slower and kind of bluesy the other one was quite heavy a a bit more kind of muse inspired yeah um and then the most recent iteration i did it with i was starting a band with a friend of mine that kind of never materialized and it was heavy kind of metal yeah and it oh my was God. <laughs> seeing seeing this transformation. I mean, it's a very simple riff and um, a really I, it's a very kind of funky song. Mm-hmm. Um, but seeing that and taking it to different people and seeing how it can evolve oh, is is great. And as I say, 
I love mashups. I love mixing different types of music. That's you know what I'm I'm all about. I absolutely yeah. love it. No, I completely agree because I uh, one of my songs which I put out in February last year, um, Landmines. Um, that's been performed in completely different ways quite a few times um, because the, the song itself is quite a rocky one. I don't really release many songs like Landmines anymore because I normally would do that kind of stuff with Kraken. But that's where it gets interesting because we played it at I think it was I think it was the last Kraken gig. Um, we played that song and oh, that was did? actually the first song which um, I've sung live as like a lead vocalist in a band. And I haven't really done anything like that since. Um, and that's interesting comparing it to how I play it nowadays on acoustic guitar because it's quite like a funky, um, heavy acoustic song um, as opposed to how it started off. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, have you? So apart from "Screw You," have <laughs> Have uh, any of the songs which you've brought to like Dear Ramona been played before? Or has all of those been its own thing? Um, Amber was briefly kind of experimented with when I was with the Equinox. Mm. Um, but we never actually kind of gigged it. It was more of a, oh, this is a song idea. Let's get some riffs down and kind of quickly play it. And then it kind of fizzled out. Mm -hmm. um, but no, most of the Dear Ramona stuff is... Is is pretty is original really and has been written with all of us and we've put our kind of staple on it which is yeah really good. I think I think it's cool comparing, especially because I've heard a couple of your own stuff which you haven't brought to Ramona and mm. that Ramona stuff. I think although it's it's quite easy to tell differences because of the whole instrumentation, like having a full band versus just you. But I think the actual songwriting is different too. And I think it's I think it's interesting hearing people's own works outside of any other people's influences against what they put forward in like a band scenario absolutely and I, I think as well empathy is a real kind of example of that hopefully mm. you know you'll all get to listen to that soon we'll release it soon yeah but kind of started off as quite sad jazzy i mean i wrote it at kind of three o'clock in the morning i couldn't sleep but yeah all that kind of stuff and um i took it to john and we kind of smoothed it out. It was a bit rough around the edges. We kind of smoothed it out. Um, and I kind of wanted a bit Groove Armada-inspired, kind of chill jazz. Um, and then we kind of brought Kate in, sped it up. It became a bit more kind of rocky. Um, and then in the recording, John just cracked out all these amazing guitar yeah. bits. And it kind of really, really changed shape mm. into... The kind of funky, rough, whatever it has become. I yeah, don't know well, kind of what to categorise it as. I think I'm starting to forget what it was like because it's been a while since I've actually heard it from the recorded it's version. It's been a good while, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> whenever I hear that song, um, I know from hearing it that it was, it was written to be played in the band, yeah. 100%. Oh, absolutely. It's got so many parts where people just mess around with. Yeah. Um, it's got some really funky clouds in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it's just a really cool one. Um, it's well I think it's one of my favourites which you guys have because it's just a jam yeah and I mean that literally like you can just like play along to it with any instrument and you'll find a way well yeah and I mean that's again I've kind of said it a few times but that I think that kind of came from my my jazz roots mm -hmm. you know my my kind of training as it were on the saxophone consisted of a lot of you've got your jazz songs and you've got the head and then you just go and solo and you'll, you know, have a trombonist against a saxophonist. You'll have a trumpeter, three trumpets going at the same time. Empathy was one that I kind of wanted that cacophony and I wanted that whatever's going on is happening. And that I think that kind of, especially in the recording, that came out in my saxophone solo a bit because I had a bit of an idea what I was going to play. But then I just kind of improvised it and even the bits that went wrong, actually, those were the nicer takes because... Yeah. Again, it was rough around the edges, it was a bit cacophonous, and it was, it kind of just all came together and we were throwing things in. James was doing synth stuff, John was doing some really funky guitar stuff, and yeah, it was just a whole lot of fun, and mm -hmm. it all kind of came together yeah. really nicely. Especially comparing it to the other Dear Amanda songs, as I've said many times before, the completely different genres which you guys have are really cool. Yeah. Because it does still sound like Dear Ramona, which I think is the, is the most important thing is that you have a band which still sounds like you, even if you can do, like experiment with completely different like themes and genres. Yeah. Um, okay. We do this every single time we have a podcast. Oh, no. This is the time which JJ is going to have to think on his feet. Oh, but so not ready um, for this. 
I think each time I've tried to do this, it's been the same kind of question. Um, name any bands which you would like to be a part of in the space of one minute. Be a part of? Yes. If you could be in any band, what bands would you choose starting now? Uh, okay, Queens of Stone Age, Foo Fighters. I mean, if you could be in the Beatles, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be amazing. Talk about change of genres. Um, man. Uh, the Kaiser Chiefs. I adore Kaiser Chiefs. I've already forgotten what I said. Uh, Radiohead. Um, Maroon 5. What? I know. Oh my god. I may come on that later. Um, uh, You've still got 30 seconds. I know, I've still got 30 seconds. Man. Uh, oh, um, uh, Blossoms. Uh, Catfish the Bottle Man. I mean, my my classics, um, Soundgarden. Yeah. Um, uh, d- d- have you heard someone struggle so much? You are struggling so much. It's a hard question. Well, we've just run out of time, okay. so we're very lucky. But that's, I, you know, I mean, I was thinking kind of bands that, I say, kind of have different genres and a sound of their own, particularly... Um, Oh, then Cricket Vultures, that's another one. Like, mm. so Josh Homme and... Um, Josh, Hom- Josh who? Homme. 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 Hom. Josh Homme. I think it's Homme. I don't know. I thought it was Homme. Homme. Anyway. And Dave Grohl, you know, they're less so... Um, what was it? Eagles? The, Eagles of death metal. death metal. Yeah, with Jesse Hughes. Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. But I, that was kind of... That's what got me into music. I, you know, remember sat in the car with my brother and him putting on a... Uh, Queens of Stone Age CD and me going oh this is amazing yeah. and then that kind of led to them Cricket Vultures and I love them Cricket Vultures because of the weird jazz influences and the weird kind of funky folky influences that... well that's an amazing band because you've got Queens of the Stone Age uh, Foo Fighters Slash Nirvana and yeah. Led Zeppelin and it's just like what is well, going exactly. on? I think that's that's the ultimate answer for that question for me. And it took me a minute to get there. And so, yeah, <laughs> but, you know, that was that's that's what I want to do. And like Scumbag Blues and mm. um, Elephants. Oh my god, that's like that's a tune. I, and again, talking about the kind of cacophonous nature of them, I think that's yeah, that's kind of highlighted mm. in those. But I those I songs. won't forget that you said Maroon Five. I don't know why oh, you said that. Right. Okay. So yes, I so actually people kind of go, oh, what's one of the best gigs you've ever been to? And I will hands down say Maroon 5. Because <laughs> I went to go and see Maroon 5 and I was expecting this kind of churned out stuff, like some of their albums, uh, I think it was their Overexposed tour. And um, actually they were phenomenal to watch. None of the songs were as they sound, well, you could obviously tell they were the songs, but it was kind of a bit heavier, played really well. It wasn't like stood listening to the album. It was like watching an amazing rock show. And Adam Levine was, you know, he's, he's all criticism aside that everyone may say about Marine Five, he has a fantastic voice. Um, I think it's it's interesting. He sings interesting things. Anyway, that's my opinion. <laughs> and it was just a really great show. It yeah. it was. A spectacle just in the music side of it. it it didn't have any kind of tacky things going on it wasn't poppy um and that i think because i kind of came out of it going oh my god did i just watch a maroon five show <laughs> you know i don't think i did actually um and that was that was what i really loved about that tour because mm-hmm. you know i mean I, I must admit i don't really listen to maroon 5 anymore no <laughs> which everyone will be thankful to hear right? yeah <laughs> um <laughs> but you know it was kind of what i grew up on and as so i seeing it in that form that they played it on that on that concert was was really great and i loved it and um yeah so that's that's why i said that answer my god <laughs> oh geez maroon 5 i just have vivid memories of just like um non-stop whenever you turn on the radio you have this love on during like 2005 oh. trips to school oh, I love that song um, okay. <laughs> the first album songs oh. about Jane is is a good album I like it the rest oh. were so so oh no well I'm not <laughs> gonna judge <laughs> um, well we, we, I think we're reaching the end now mm. um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about before we close things off was um, about your experience well we talked a bit about live mixing and stuff but mm. have you ever like done any like studio work before 
Um, not much. Uh, not as the kind of sound tech. Um, I did. I did a bit. I. I mean, I've done. I mean, I know it's not the same, but I was a sound tech for um, our kind of drama troupe. Um, in high school, we went to the Fringe Festival and oh, I nice. did mixing for that and picked the songs. Uh, and obviously, that's all about finding the song that tells the story and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I've done a bit. My dad, he likes to dabble in sound mixing, and my brothers um, are both musicians. One's a, a DJ, and um, the other's kind of he's looking to kind of start his career in music, and he does lots of recording and music writing, and it's great. So, kind of at home, I've always had a tweak and a fiddle with Cubase and kind of recording things. You know, when I was writing songs as a teenager, I'd kind of record the roughest mix on earth yeah. and, you know, put a drum track to it just so I had something to kind of go by and then yeah. I could write melodies off the top of that. Um, but I think the answer is pretty much no. I I helped a bit. We did, um, with the the arts charity, we recorded a, um, a charity uh, music video mm-hmm. with my old band back in high school. And Fun. I yeah. Do a bit of mixing for that. That was that was good fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, a bit bit here and there. But. Yeah, I've heard of what you've been up to and what you've been looking into tech wise. Um, I remember you talking about VR to me for quite a while. <laughs> oh yeah, and that was a that was a fun time. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's a shame I didn't pursue that. But there's yeah. time. That's the thing. Yeah, you have time to find your time to get some virtual reality in your life. Exactly. Exactly. I'll, I'll just say what a great job you've done of you know all the. All the recording, if you haven't, and for some reason you've stumbled across this podcast, go and listen to Lucky Boy Records. There's, you know, again, talking about genres, I was listening to it the other night, Rachel Gow followed by Kraken. <laughs> the, you know, the, the difference in in genres and all of them, absolutely fantastic. Pun Up Hangover as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, Charlotte Hall, everyone, Basement Strippers. Everyone on that artist, uh, on that artist, <laughs> everyone on that label is so different and unique, and to have them all in one place yeah. is has been brilliant, and I've loved being a part of it. Yeah, congrats on making great music. Yay! Um, <laughs> well, I think that's it. Um, last question is: if you were going to have any words for someone starting out in music, in any kind of uh, level, what advice would you give them if they're starting off? Just Dive in, give it a go. If you crap, you crap. You'll get better. Because, I mean, I am I am no expert musician by any means. And, you know, I was somehow a front man and a lead guitarist in however many bands. And, you know, I've picked up the skills as I went along. I think every gig for me and every time I play, I learn something new and, you know, I get slightly better and, you know, Build up the confidence and surround yourself by people that support you and that want to do what you want to do as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's the kind of winning recipe, really. Mm-hmm. Just do it for yourself and fun. And yeah. And you'll probably make something out of it. Yeah, and you'd be surprised at how many people just genuinely enjoy seeing you enjoy yourself. Yeah. You know, that's open mic nights in York. I've done a terrible rendition of a song yet yeah, I've had these drunken women on the front row filming it and go oh my god it's amazing oh I love it oh and you know it's it is it, it's, it's contagious that's what it is yeah. and you know I think that's that's a really really wonderful thing yeah amazing thank you so much for coming on then my pleasure and uh, I guess I'll see you guys next time bye bye